In this lecture, we'll focus on the third step of issues management, decision making. So we'll start with a quick reminder about issues management process and then move directly into our discussion of decision making. By this point in the process, scanning should have taken place, and this really should be ongoing. Issues management isn't about capturing a snapshot and then keeping it as the modus operandi forever. It's something that should be regularly updated, and the same is true as we move into the monitoring part, portion of the process. The really nice thing is that once scanning and the risk register are set up in the first two steps, if an organization is systematic about it, then it's not difficult to maintain with daily or weekly scans of critical sources. However, now at this point that we move into stage three, we move away from just issue information management and data reduction into a much more strategic kind of a phase. The monitoring phase and risk register create an evaluation of particular issues and threats. However, based on the categorization of these and good judgment, we have to begin to allocate proper resources to managing the issues. Now, an organization's values and its culture will certainly influence the decision making. Ethical organizations will consider a host of aspects of costs and benefits. Less ethical organizations tend to only consider profit and loss. But the first component of decision making is to prioritize issues. Prioritization, very simply, is determining which issues actually demand organizational response and when, therefore allocating resources and information demands as needed. Now, there are many different ways to analyze issues using open access and proprietary models, but these are the most critical dimensions of prioritization. First, asking what are the consequences and who will have to face the consequences of the issues. Second, how the issue is likely to actually affect the organization. Third, asking how much impact will the issue have. It's important to note, of course, that no two issues are equal and they shouldn't be treated with the same level of magnitude. Fourth, when there is an impact, if it is likely to occur, when is it going to happen? In the context of limited resources, time, a lot of times organizations are going to have to balance time scale, severity, and probability. Naturally, issues can be moved up on the agenda for action or back down to just continued monitoring, depending on prioritization. Managers assigned by organizations to monitor issues should define and prioritize their publics based on opinions people hold and their degree of involvement with the issues. The other factor to consider is, of course, the Internet. Issues that spread rapidly through the Internet, these are called issue contagions, present a relatively new and volatile challenge that is particularly important during the prioritization stage. In other words, assessing the likelihood of an issue gaining momentum via the Internet absolutely has to be considered in this part of it. The second part of decision making involves assessing the organization's strategic options. Like any other management discipline, robust issues management strategy comes from sound data, diverse viewpoints, and ingenuity. But it also relies on credible information and identifying realistic and measurable objectives, providing the foundation for effective, anticipatory, and responsive strategy development. When an organization is going through its strategic options, what it has to do is to try to figure out what kinds of scenarios could happen before they can make decisions. So this is where certainly good intelligence coming from the risk register comes in. However, there's also a creative aspect to this process. Issues management people need to take a look at the risk register and start to put together scenarios, worst case scenarios in their minds that could actually happen. Along these lines, anticipatory management specialists, William Ashley and James Morrison, suggest a six step process to creating multiple scenarios. Specifically, first, they must frame the issue. For example, for an organization that could affect the environment, say a lumber company, they would ask, how is the organization contributing to environmental degradation in an area 
and what can be done to re reduce that kind of negative impact. The second part of their process asks, what are the specific decision factors that have to be put into place? Or what questions do, does an issue bring up that must be addressed? Third, to identify the environmental factors by scanning and monitoring, then selecting a logic or a storyline. So think about how these forces might take different paths. For example, energy utilities faced with environmental concerns are making the choices between retrofitting or updating existing facilities versus entirely rebuilding and repowering new facilities. Fourth, organizations at this stage need to develop alternative scenarios. For example, they would need to have a short-term low cost and but higher risk of failure compared to medium-term higher cost and more permanent kinds of solutions. Then, of course, they need to decide on the implications of their paths and the situations and articulate, then sixth, the recommended actions. From Ashley and Morrison's process for creating possible scenarios, the decision process then comes back into play, and there are these four components to it. Initially, the organization has to decide on risk mitigation actions. Not only does the organization need to decide whether it's going to invest in the risk mitigation process, but also what possible actions of all those that they can imagine should they take. Second, part of the decision-making process is also identifying the opportunity costs associated with risk mitigation. For example, if an organization allocates resources to avoiding a possible crisis, what will that mean for growth, shareholder return, and so on in the short, medium, and long term? Third, even when the organization acts to mitigate the risks posed by issues, the third part of the process asks what residual risks will remain. That is to say, will the actions completely eliminate the risk? Will they create other threats? Or will the actions merely reduce the risk of the th threat? For example, in healthcare settings, all medical procedures and medications come with risks. This is why we talk with our doctors about the risks versus the benefits. This is what organizations do at this stage of the process. And finally, once the decisions are taken, the ownership for the solutions has to be allocated. Ultimately, everything in the issues management process should have an owner. That is, someone who is responsible for executing some part of the plan. The final component to the decision-making process is actually taking action. You'd think this was obvious, but anyone who's been around organizations long enough will know that there's always a lot of talk about actions, but sometimes, even with an action owner assigned, nothing happens. So it's useful to point out that the action stage is actually required. According to issues manager practitioner expert Tony Jacques, the greatest barriers to effective issues management are the lack of clear objectives and the unwillingness or inability to act. As he points out, the issues management process is one that has to be associated with achieved results. The scanning, monitoring, prioritization, and strategic decision-making steps have absolutely no value unless action is taken towards achieving very specific and measurable objectives. Jacques also makes the point that issues management no longer belongs to corporations. In fact, community organizations, NGOs, other activist and advocacy groups have enacted some of the most innovative and aggressive successful issues management initiatives in the modern era. See, for example, Greenpeace's role in drafting the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, an international treaty to curb greenhouse gases. The agreement was sub subsequently ratified by almost all countries other than the U.S. Yet without the U.S. ratifying it, it was unlikely to be successful. This is why the Paris Agreement came about in 2016 and why it was so important. The U.S. had finally decided to get on board with the environmental protection. That is, until President Trump pulled out of it.
in fit part the failure of the paris agreement as a global initiative that include the u s failed because of the core disagreements over its objectives so when we look at critical components to taking action one essential ingredient for success of initiatives like this is that they are guided by a singular clear set of objectives driven by committed actors who are willing and able to take action just as in any good campaign or initiative clear actionable objectives are vital for the success of the decision then because we're dealing with real life one of the other questions that organizations have to ask in the decision-making process is what happens if our original course of action fails organizations that are the most successful at issues management always have contingency plans because things just go wrong sometimes so just like we prioritize the risks and the issues themselves the risk mitigation actions that will take place also have to be prioritized prioritizing risk mitigation actions is about balancing the cost of the action with its benefit there's also a bit of a balancing act if some less expensive options could be attempted first the question is should the organization try the less costly but probably also less effective actions first to see if they actually solve the problem in most cases this is a matter of trying to predict the success potential of the less expensive options the problem though can come in false economy where the less expensive options either mean that the organization is going to take the more expensive changes later and they're just trying to kick the can down the road or in a worst case scenario when they're implemented a crisis still happens and the impact of the crisis is so terrible that it means not only an outlay of extra money but in the damage done could be potentially irreparable let me offer you an example in the uk in twenty seventeen we saw a terrible fire in a high-rise apartment complex it turns out that the council in an effort to make the complex look more attractive because it was low-income housing in quite a posh area put cladding on the outside of the building the particular cladding they chose was inexpensive and looked nice the problem was that if there was a fire it could cause catastrophic damage this particular cladding used was illegal in many countries the u s and germany being two examples unfortunately in two thousand seventeen the worst happened a fire in a twenty-plus story building where many of the people living on the fourteenth floor and higher had absolutely no chance of escape the typical recommendations from the fire departments in this case is for people to stay in their flats because these buildings are meant to be constructed so the fires are easy to contain but the cladding make the recommendations deadly this cladding was something like half the cost of cladding that was actually recommended and fire resistant and it turns out that the overwhelming majority of high-rise apartments in England have cladding used of this, of this particular dangerous type, despite the risks. This is a good example of decision-making that prioritized short-term financial costs against the long-term risks and decided that the risks of calamity were so low that while the consequences were severe, the property was probability was low enough and in the decision calculus this was the decision made so this is a good example of the decision process and issues management that happens all the time to greater and lesser levels of success now you'll notice that at this stage it may not be particularly in the remit of public relations and communications professionals so while issues management often starts with us it also has to be a cross-functional task to ensure that the right people are making the decisions so while the particular actions that an organization takes may not be directly related to communication we're almost always a part of the process because whether the communication strategy is entirely internal or external or most likely a combination of both were nearly always a part of the action stage of the process and often involved throughout the decision-making process. And of course, if you're interested in more readings, these are a good place to get started.